last session of the day. Um, my name's Judith Friedman. I was at the University of Oxford, and I am supposedly retired, although I haven't mastered that art yet. Um, and I'm chair of the Tax Law Review Committee of the IFS. Um, and we have here to talk about taxing wealth transfers um, for really great experts. David Sturrock himself from the IFS, who's done a lot of work on this with colleagues. Dan Goss from Dermos, who has been doing some um, polling work and, and um, <clears throat> focus groups. Um, Emma Chamberlain from Pump Court Tax Chambers, a barrister, also one of the authors of the Wealth Tax Commission that the LSE produced. And um, Holly Toynbee, who's from The Guardian, who needs no um, introduction from me and has been working in this area for a very long time. But is no expert. <laughs> <laughs> So a really good group. Um, we're going to be talking about taxing wealth transfers. Now, tax has come up already a lot today. Um, it's always the answer to everybody's problems. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I'm not sure that's always true. Um, sometimes tax is the problem as well. But um, we will see this afternoon whether there is anything that can be done. So I'm going to turn over to David to start. <clears throat> Great, thanks very much and um, well done to everyone who's been here for all of the sessions, uh, final one. Um, I'm going to be talking about the economics of taxing wealth transfers, uh, focusing mostly on uh, kind of reforming inheritance tax in the UK, but I'll try and raise some wider questions as well that we might come back to in the discussion. So why are we talking about this? Well, there's, of course, the perennial discussion of inheritance tax reform that sparked up again um, this summer, um, culminating in rumoured uh, cut in abolition to inheritance tax that in the end didn't materialise in the autumn statement, but perhaps is going to come back as an issue in a future budget or maybe in the run-up to the election. But aside from how this is um, discussed, there is a strong case for reforming our inheritance tax and thinking about the design of wealth transfer tax more generally. Within the current system, there are definitely many things that can be improved upon that we're going to talk about, including exemptions and unequal treatments of uh, different types of wealth and different types of transfers. And broadly, it's important that we get this form of taxation right as inheritances uh, continue to grow as compared to earned incomes. So I'll first of all just give a very quick rundown of how inheritance tax works in its current form. So some inheritance tax base basics. In principle, in its broad parameters, inheritance tax is quite a simple tax, at least as taxes go. Uh, so what is tax? The tax base is estates that are left at death, excluding that which is transferred to a surviving spouse or civil partner. Then added to that are gifts made in the final seven years before death. Um, there are some allowances for wealth that you can uh, give away before you start paying tax. Everyone has a nil rate band of 325,000 pounds. There's then a residence nil rate band, which is an additional 175,000 pounds tax free uh, for houses that are passed to direct descendants, i.e. children, grandchildren, and so on. So together, that means someone can pass on half a million, uh, or up to half a million tax-free. But these allowances um, can also be passed on to spouses. Uh, unused portions of them can be given to a surviving partner. So if, when the first member of a couple dies, they pass on their wealth to their spouse, who then gives it to the kids. Together, they could give away, on that second death, up to one million pounds tax-free. <coughs> Above that is then a 40% rate, uh, just one tax rate, although as we'll hear about, there are further exemptions to the tax. Because of that up to one million pound tax-free threshold, inheritance tax is pretty small in its current form. Only about 5.5% uh, of people have inheritance tax paid after their death at the moment. That's slightly up from its long run average of about 4%. We might consider people who, uh, as affected by the tax, even if 
they don't pay it uh, on, on their estate, or it's not paid on their estate, but is paid on their partner's death, uh, on that basis, 9% of people are affected by the tax. Um, but because of this small number of people paying the tax, and as we'll see because of some exemptions too, um, it's fiscally quite small, raising about seven billion pounds a year. That's less than 1% of what the government spends. Although we expect that to grow rapidly over time. Um, as shown in this chart, um, inheritance tax revenues have kind of fluctuated around 0.2% of GDP uh, over time. As those older ages hold more and more wealth, we expect that at least on current government policy for inheritance tax, uh, it's set to, to rise quite quickly in the coming decade or so, up to about half a percent of GDP. But still in the grand scheme of things, fiscally not that big. So who is uh, paying that tax? Um, again, because of that quite high exemption threshold, the vast majority of people are paying no inheritance tax at death, and those that do are going to be concentrated in the top uh, part of the wealth distribution. 80% of inheritance tax revenues come from the wealthiest fifth, shown by that final bar here. And in fact, even within that, the top 1% are contributing over uh, half of all inheritance tax revenues. And those people are also geographically concentrated in the south of England. So that's the current uh, tax, at least in broad terms. Uh, what are some problems and ways in which it could be improved? Um, first of all, um, inheritance tax does not treat all assets the same way. There's quite a few um, significant carve-outs for different types of wealth. So business, uh, property relief, and agricultural relief uh, exempt um, potentially entirely uh, certain types of business and agricultural property from inheritance tax, um, provided they're held for some minimal time before death. And that can encompass not just kind of small family businesses, but also can include certain types of arm's length held shares. Pension pots are currently completely outside of estates and inheritance tax free, so form a pretty potentially um, easy way to pass on uh, wealth without paying inheritance tax. And then, as I already mentioned, there's a special treatment given to uh, main property passed to direct descendants, this residence no right band. And um, there's going to be differences in the ability to take advantage of that, depending on whether people are living in parts of the country where more of their wealth is held as housing. So for all of these types of special treatments, uh, this leads to several types of problems. First of all, you might see it as unfair that this tax is levied on some wealth passed on, but not other types. Um, that, in turn, will lead to reduced revenues compared to if these things were taxed. And it's also going to mean that people uh, at older ages are distorted in their decision-making about how to hold their wealth, not doing what is potentially best for them or, or the most productive investment for the economy, but making decisions about where to put their wealth based on its inheritance tax treatment. Secondly, there is special treatment given to some types of transfers. Uh, so focusing in on some of the uh, particular rules that come into play around giving um, near to death. Um, as I've said, uh, gifts in principle can be included within the estate and subject to inheritance tax, but as well as a kind of general uh, minimal exemption, there are various other rules uh, which some people are able to take advantage of. For example, giving that is so-called normal expenditure out of income, so defined roughly as something which someone can, uh, a gift that someone can make out of their income without depleting their assets or their living standards is completely exempt from um, inheritance tax. And that, as you can imagine, is something that some people are going to be able to take advantage of while others can't, depending on their financial circumstances. Um, you might have an idea, if you kind of looked into inheritance tax a bit, that gifts further away from the time of death are taxed more lightly by the system. That's in some sense true, but it's really quite a odd and complicated way in which that happens. 
um, which no longer really makes much sense. Finally, um, there's an exe exemption for uh, transfers made to charities and a reduced rate of inheritance tax paid if more than 10% of an estate is given to charity. The government might want to encourage charitable giving, but the idea that it does that just through uh, the inheritance tax system um, or, or additionally through the inheritance tax system seems a bit odd. Why is it that charitable giving when alive is not favored in such a way? Um, finally, I probably don't have time to get in, into the details here, um, but the spousal exemption for transfers made to spouses combined with some other elements of the tax system can mean that that allows people, particularly those with higher wealth, to avoid um, inheritance tax um, on some of their, of their transfers. So what, would, what could we do about some of these, um, these oddities and unfairnesses in the system? Well, um, in some work with Aaron Advani, we recommended the following things. First of all, to abolish, or if that is kind of not deemed to be acceptable, uh, cap business and agricultural reliefs to reduce the scope of uh, the ability to use that for um, avoidance. Bring defined contribution pensions into the scope of inheritance tax. Um, so that is uh, something which is going to become a growing issue over time because defined contribution pensions are the way that people of working age today are saving for their retirement. While they're not so common now at older ages, they will be in the future. Third, to abolish the residence nil rate band and equalize the treatment uh, by the inheritance tax system of those passing on housing and any other type of wealth. If you wanted to, you could um, kind of move the, the threshold up so that everyone can pass on half a million tax-free. And finally, rationalizing the treatment of gifts by getting rid of the various rules that exempt certain types of gifts, perhaps just having one amount which can be given each year uh, tax-free um, and getting rid of the uh, way in which so-called taper relief reply, applies to gifts given further away from death. Um, again, we, we might think there are sort of broader things that could be done on gifts. We might come back to this in the discussion. Perhaps we might want to think about extending the period that we look back into people's lives or changing our approach to taxing gifts more widely. These are kind of more narrow recommendations. While we're here, I'll mention a couple of other things um, that at the IFS, and anyway, we always bring up um, around taxation at death. The first is the fact that capital gains, for the purposes of capital gains tax, are kind of wiped out at the point of death. So um, if you get a big capital gain, but then you pass it on to a kid, uh, that gain is going to escape capital gains tax forever. And secondly, to charge income tax on inherited pension pots, regardless of the age of the person who died. At the moment, there's a kind of odd situation whereby if you die before age 75 and pass on your pension, there will never be any income tax paid on that pension. So what would be the impacts of these uh, reforms? First of all, thinking about the revenue impacts. Um, abolishing business relief, we estimate would raise a, a, a bit of around about um, a billion and a bit of revenue. should say that this estimate is a little bit higher than HMRC's. That by itself could fund a cut in the inheritance tax rate to 34% or an increase in the, the nil rate band to £415,000. You don't have to, of course, use that revenue to uh, cut inheritance tax. It could also be used to uh, fund spending or do something else. And I should note that um, we estimate that about 80% of the benefits in fiscal terms of doing such a reform could be achieved by capping business relief at £500,000 per person because much of that business wealth which is passed on is held um, uh, in large estates. Agricultural relief, we weren't able to analyze directly ourselves, but HMRC estimate raises 400 million in, um, in revenue if, it, if abolished. Bringing pension pots into the scope of inheritance tax raise a more, bon more modest 200 million now, but that's gonna grow in time. Abolishing the residence nil rate band and giving everyone half a million tax-free would come at a cost of, a, of about 700 million. 
Um, but if you were to combine these reforms, so getting rid of some of these reliefs, um, raising the, the, the getting rid of the, the, the residence no right band, you could increase the no right band for everyone to around 525k, or cut the rate right down to 25%. So what would be the effects in terms of uh, who is going to be paying this tax, the distributional impact um, of these inheritance tax reforms? Here I'm putting um, estates into different wealth groups. I should note, these are definitely not even-sized groups. Most people are down towards the bottom, um, but we're just looking in within those who are potentially paying something. So at the moment, because of some of these exemptions and reliefs, while the rate of inheritance tax, uh, the effective rate of inheritance tax paid uh, increases as we look at larger estates, it actually declines when we're looking at the very largest estates because they're much more taking advantage of, uh, for example, uh, business relief. So if we were to cap business relief, bring pensions into the scope of inheritance tax, that would have, um, at least in this kind of static uh, world without people doing other things to avoid inheritance tax, uh, significantly increase the effective tax rate on estates, particularly those at the top end above 5 million. It wouldn't do that much for those lower down who hold little of this type of wealth. <laughs> Abolishing the uh, residence nil rate band and giving everyone half a million tax free takes a kind of non-negligible chunk of people out of tax, everyone less than half a million, and some of those with between 500k and 1 million. It doesn't do much at the top end. But if you combine all these things, what you do is you, um, in a broadly reven revenue neutral way, shift the burden of taxation away from those with these um, more modest estates, still a lot of wealth in, in the broad scheme, and towards the very top end. So uh, I will stop there. Um, inheritance tax is, uh, inheritance tax revenues are set to grow quickly over time. Abolishing inheritance tax would uh, give a large benefit to the wealthiest 1% and those particularly uh, at the top of the wealth distribution in general. There are some reforms that could rationalize the system and um, in combination with other changes tilt uh, the burden of taxation more towards the largest estates. We also think that the treatment of gifts should be rationalized and a range of other oddnesses around taxation at death um, should be uh, eliminated. Wider questions which we might get onto about the structure of wealth transfers would of course still remain and hopefully we can discuss those. I'll put up some key questions to give you an idea, but I should stop. <laughs> turn over to Dan who has some interesting thoughts about what people believe Absolutely. inheritance tax is and how it works and how it would impact on them. Oh, mm. oh yeah, great. Cool. Um, yeah, hi everyone, I'm Dan, I'm from Demos and I'll be talking about public attitudes to inheritance tax. I'll try and speak for the 60 million people in the UK and see where that gets us. Um, I'll be first talking about some of the assumptions about public attitudes to inheritance tax. What is driving the discourse? What are the politicians thinking currently? Then we'll be questioning those assumptions. We'll be um, yeah, looking at whether those assumptions hold up in different contexts. It wouldn't be interesting otherwise. And then we'll be moving beyond the polls. A lot of these assumptions are driven by polls. We'll be trying to see how people speak about inheritance tax in different scenarios, primarily focus groups, and seeing how that changes our understanding. So firstly, looking at the assumptions. Well, the main assumption driving the politics really is that inheritance tax is Britain's most hated tax. We see headlines like this, that inheritance tax is Britain's most unfair levy, according to polls, that inheritance tax is a spectre that haunts Britain. This is the campaign by Nadim Zahawi and the Telegraph to get rid of it, that um, Tory MP saying a 1 million inheritance tax threshold could win them the election. And also that Rishi Sunak was drawing up plans to slash the tax as a crowd-pleasing policy, first for the Tory conference and then for the autumn statement. Neither materialised, but 
it may still be on the cards, especially looking towards the spring budget next year. So why is this the picture of inheritance tax? That is Britain's most hated tax. Well, it's polls such as this one from Ipsos. This shows that inheritance tax is seen as the least fair tax of all. This asks, do you consider the following taxes to be fair or unfair? And as you can see, inheritance tax comes bottom of the pack. 23% say it's fair, but 43% say it's unfair. And that net is lower than any other tax they ask about. But it's not just that people see it as unfair. They also want it gone. A majority of the public support abolishing inheritance tax completely, that's 55%, and 65% support raising the minimum threshold of 325,000. Just 14% support increasing the current 40% rate. So it seems the public want it gone. The polls say so, apparently, but we can question those assumptions by looking at some other polls. And so this one, we've seen this one, showing that inheritance tax is the least fair tax. We might assume that it being seen as the least fair tax, the public would prioritise that one to cut, get rid of the least fair tax first. But this doesn't quite hold up. Actually, when we ask the public which taxes they think the government should cut first, give them three options, um, choose a maximum of three, inheritance tax doesn't even make the top five. Just 14% say the government should prioritise an inheritance tax cut. And this is lower than the basic rate of income tax, council tax, VAT, fuel duty and national insurance. People prefer to cut taxes, they actually pay it seems, which as we've seen, not many actually do pay inheritance tax. Just 14% choose inheritance tax as their top three priorities for a cut. And though we saw before that actually the public apparently want to abolish inheritance tax, but this isn't quite what's on offer. The offer is abolish inheritance tax and lose seven billion of public funding or 15 billion by 2032. And when we present these trade-offs in polling, we see a completely different picture. Just one in seven Brits think that the government should scrap inheritance tax rather than use the money for other things. So we asked, would you rather spend the money on scrapping inheritance tax or to reduce borrowing, or to spend it on public services like the NHS and schools? And just 14% across the country choose to scrap inheritance tax. And in marginal constituencies, and these are the 150 Conservative-held seats with the lowest majorities, just 1 in 11, 9% of people choose to scrap inheritance tax. So these are really small numbers. It seems quite an odd thing to be focusing on in today's politics. Um, but maybe the Conservatives don't see this as a real reflection of the politics, or maybe they don't really care about how the public land on the trade-offs. What they can care about more is what, um, how people might respond to them politically. And maybe this is, has a greater implication for elections. But we actually find that scrapping inheritance tax would hardly boost the Conservatives' favourability. So across the whole country, the Conservatives would get a two percentage point net boost in favourability from scrapping inheritance tax. This is 18% say they would see them more favourably, about 17% say they would see them less favourably. And in marginal constituencies, again, this 150 conservative held constituencies, this net boost is just is, is, is nil. 18% say they would see the Conservatives more favourably, 18% say they would see them less favourably. And then when we compare this to the same question if they spent the money on the NHS, it's completely um, a different picture. 32% net boost across the country and 35% in marginal constituencies. So again, the choice seems clear. And it's not just about people's political response. We also ask people to set the threshold and see how the public themselves would design inheritance tax. And we th find that actually the public choose to have higher taxation on inheritances when we ask them to set the threshold. And interestingly, this came in a survey. The question before this, we asked a simple disagree or agree question. What do you think about inheritance tax? Do you agree we should have it or not? And 55% said all inheritances should be completely tax-free. This was the question after. We presented a set of amounts, one of which was all inheritances should be completely tax-free. But suddenly, when we present the amounts, just 21% of people say all inheritances should be completely tax-free. And actually, 75% of people set the threshold lower than the one million that married couples face if handing over houses to their children. And the median response was that just 300,000 should be tax-free. And this is lower than what we see as the a threshold that most families experience.
So why do we see such a disparity between these two different types of polls? Well, I think there are three key reasons. The first, that some polls ask people to think about inheritance tax in isolation, which we've seen, but others ask people to consider the trade-offs, and we get a completely different response if the trade-offs are considered. The second, that questions on fairness, as we saw, um, which drive a lot of the discourse, push people to think about the morality of the tax. And inheritance tax scores quite low on moral concerns. It's seen as a death tax and double taxation. But when considering a policy reform, many are more concerned about how it will affect them financially. And as we've seen, inheritance scores quite well on this because it doesn't affect most people financially. And lastly, some people see inheritance tax as unfair because of how it is designed. These people may prefer reform to actually scrapping the tax. And it's not completely clear from the polls how people's response would land according to these issues. Some people might consider the tax in isolation. Some people might consider it in the context of its trade-offs. What is a slightly clearer idea is to talk to people in a conversational setting, beyond the artificial setting that polls create. And so in doing so, we hope to move beyond the polls. And this is something that we at Demos have done through a series of focus groups. But importantly, we recognize that people think about inheritance tax in very different ways. They begin from very different fundamental premises. So we wanted to understand how each way of thinking manifests, how people talk amongst themselves with people they agree with about inheritance tax, and then see how we can bridge some of those divides between different groups. To do this, we ran a cluster analysis. So we initially ran our survey on attitudes to inheritance tax. We then ran what is called a cluster analysis, and this divides respondents to a survey into particular groups based on their patterns of responses. Um, I'll talk through those groups in a second. We then ran focus groups with each distinct cluster group, speaking to over 100 people in total. And these are the four groups that presented themselves within the survey. On the far left, we have the aspirational individualists. And these tend to think inheritances should generally be tax-free. They are typically non-graduate, older, home-owning, conservative voters, about 30% of the population. They talk about inheritance often in terms of individual rights or anecdotes about them and their friends and their aspirations. Next, we have the fiscal skeptics, and these are typically middle-aged, middle-income renters, about 22% of the population in total. And these talk about inheritance more in terms of government inefficiencies and the inefficiencies generally within the tax and spending system, and they see inheritance tax as part of this failing system. Next, we have the social pragmatists. These are typically older, home county, home owning, high earners. And they see that the government should be doing more to help those in need. And they see inheritance tax often as a good way to fund this as a tax primarily on the wealthiest in society. Last, we have the radical progressives. These typically are young metropolitan graduates. And they tend to think most inheritances should be taxed. Um, they talk about inheritance in a slightly different way. They talk about generational inequality and um, taxing unearned income more equal to earned income. And so these are the four groups. We then try to understand what are some of the key narratives and the key ways of thinking that these groups think about inheritance tax, and both in terms of their sympathies towards inheritance tax and in their concerns about the tax. And then we try to analyze what are some of the shared sympathies and shared concerns across the groups. We found that really driving the conversation in sympathy for the tax is its contribution to government funding. Here we see a table showing um, different attitudes and how the groups agree with them. Full green boxes show full agreement within those groups. Lighter green shows partial agreement. And we see that some of the key attitudes driving this sympathy are the fact that the ultra wealthy are too wealthy that it is important that the government has funds and that scrapping inheritance tax could cause unacceptable trade-offs, particularly in terms of cuts of public funding and other taxes rising. Agreement among most of the groups, but some of the aspirational individualists wouldn't agree, is that inheritance of things like secondary homes should be taxed more, which was quite a, a visible issue um, for some groups. And then also the idea that it is right to tax inheritances as long as the threshold is at the right level. So while some of the aspirational individualists did take a more absolutist stance that inheritance tax is never okay, most of the other groups felt that there was some threshold which would make them happy with the tax. But really what we care about more potentially is what are the concerns and how can we overcome people's concerns. And we find that there are quite a lot of concerns about inheritance tax. 
Um, primarily, that inheritance tax just needs a lot of reform and also a better reason why it exists. And here's some of the individual attitudes driving some of those concerns. The idea that inheritance has a small impact on inequalities in the UK. And I know at a conference like this, we're talking about social mobility. Many of us may disagree, but the public really do not see the link between inheritance and inequalities in the UK particularly strongly currently. They feel much more important factors are around the housing market, but also um, things like um, geography and education. There's also the idea that inherited inequality is just a part of life. There's quite a defeatism about it. People feel that it is above politics and definitely above the politicians that we have today. There is also a sense that and general scepticism about the tax and spending system, that money from the tax system should be spent better, and that government spending just isn't transparent enough, and inheritance tax really is a key part of these problems. We see also the sense that we need a better reason why inheritance tax exists. Because there isn't this clear link between inequalities and inheritance among the public, people feel that it's quite an arbitrary tax. It's just a way for government to get some more money without a clear reason why. There's also concerns that inheritance tax risks being the politics of envy, potentially an attack on the hardworking people of the UK, and also just this very prevalent sense that avoidance of inheritance tax is a big problem, that the ultra-wealthy can avoid the tax. Some slightly more, um, not universal concerns, but broadly shared concerns are that um, inheritance tax places too many burdens at a sad time, that it's double taxation, and I know this dominates a lot of the narrative, but actually... This wasn't, this was people's initial reaction often that it's double taxation, but didn't dominate a lot of the conversations after that. And especially some groups didn't necessarily see it as a definite problem. Um, the idea that inheritance tax is anti-aspirational, that it really punishes the aspiration of hardworking families. And then agreement um, that isn't generally shared by the social pragmatists and radical progressives is some of the stuff around individual rights, the idea that people have a right to their family's property, and this is a big concern among the aspirational individualists and fiscal skeptics, but less so the others, that capital gains should not be taxed in inheritance, that inheritance tax is just grabbing money wherever they can. And this is a slightly more cynical take that the government is almost sort of trying to deceive the public in various ways. Um, the idea that we shouldn't tax in inheritances because it hits some people unfairly, and this is policy driven by anecdotes in a way that if some people, if we can think of an anecdote of somebody hit unfairly, scrap the tax. And also that inheritance tax should not be used to tackle generational inequality. And the aspirational individuals and fiscal skeptics really felt like this was not something the government should be playing a hand in. So just to give some life to a couple of those points, um, here are some quotes from our focus groups. Um, this first person saying, with stuff like VAT and council tax, you're getting something in return, aren't you? Obviously, if I'm buying a product, yes, you're going to pay 20% tax on that. If I'm paying council tax, I'm getting risk service in return. Whereas inheritance tax, it's money which I've already paid tax on. It's not doing anything. I'm not going to get anything out of it. Really emphasizes the idea that people just feel alienated with the reason why inheritance tax exists. And secondly, this person talking more about the design and the impression of its poor design is that it seems to be a very middle income tax, which I don't really like the idea of, because it should be progressive. I think I agree with having one, but I think it's too easy for the ultra wealthy to find a way to avoid and really undermining the credibility of the tax. So we at Demos try to figure out some ways that we could address some of these concerns while emphasizing the reason why people are sympathetic towards inheritance tax. And we suggest a range of policies that policymakers should explore um, in order to do so. We find that the politicians should explore hypothecation, linking inheritance tax to compelling spending commitments to provide that reason why it exists. Fixing the loopholes, making the system simpler and harder to avoid to enhance its credibility. Easing the administrative burden, perhaps by allowing people more time to pay inheritance tax after a death. Linking thresholds to property prices, and also shifting the focus onto the wealth of the recipient by taxing the receipt of inheritance, and we may discuss this in the rest of the discussion, and adjusting the rates based on the recipient's wealth. And this is something that Spain do, um, which is quite interesting and could sort of reinforce that idea that it is a tax on high amounts of wealth as opposed to on aspiration. Um, and we hope that this is some of the things that politicians could do to secure inheritance tax in the long term and make it a slightly more, less controversial issue. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Um, moving over now to Emma, who will comment. 
Thank you. Well, though those comments um, from Demos and the, the focus groups very much chime with what I hear from clients, actually. Um, but a bit of history first. Inheritance tax comes out of capital transfer tax, which comes out of estate duty, which was introduced in 1894. Rates between 1 and 8 percent, and it was raising about 35 percent, account, accounted for 35 percent of our tax revenues. Now it's less than 1 percent. So you can see the difference. It was an extremely important part of the revenue we raised. Um, we haven't, since then, we had uh, estate duty was a very easy tax to avoid, and Healy introduced capital transfer tax, which was a cradle to the grave tax, so you were taxed on all lifetime giving in 1975. Um, unfortunately, that didn't raise any more money for reasons we can discuss, um, and he bitterly reflected in his autobiography that he was forced to give in to a number of vested interests and offer various reliefs. And then in 1986, Nigel Lawson um, renamed capital transfer tax inheritance tax. So it's a curious mixture of capital transfer tax and estate duty. And some of the design problems that we've seen have come from this peculiar mixture of those two taxes. And I, I think in a way it has the worst of both worlds. But given we've sort of spent 100 or 130 years not getting it right, have other countries done better? And I think when we look across the OECD, um, we see that they haven't really. Um, 24 out of 36 of OECD countries have some form of inheritance tax or wealth transfer tax, but the rest don't. And there's been a steady move to abolition in the early 2000s, late 1990s, 2000s. And when you read the literature about what is causing the problems with those taxes, very similar points are coming up as we're hearing today. So, for example, Sweden abolished its inheritance tax and then its wealth tax around 04, 2004. And the reason they did was that basically middle class people paid it, but it, very wealthy people didn't pay it. And it was because the base was too narrow. So one of the things that I think whatever we do on inheritance tax, if we keep it, which I personally think we should, if you broaden the base, you will have more general acceptability around it. And people are right when they say that inheritance tax is avoided. It is avoided because two out of the three main assets, sources of wealth in this country, are really often exempt from inheritance tax. And if you think about it, our house, is one third of the sort of wealth, nation's wealth. That is very difficult to avoid inheritance tax on, and that is often owned um, largely by what we call the wealthier middle class. They can't give it away because there's a load of anti avoidance legislation that says if you give it away and you continue to live in it, you will not be able to, um, you'll still pay inheritance tax on your death. By contrast, as we've just heard, pensions are largely inheritance tax free. And that is quite a large source of the nation's wealth. And then you've got business assets, farms. A lot of those are completely exempt from inheritance tax. So you have got a very narrow base focused on quite a limited class, or an important class, but nevertheless, it's not necessarily the wealthiest people. And I think when we, un when we look at that, we might get a better understanding of why inheritance tax is so unpopular. It's not that people necessarily disagree with the principle, but what they perceive rightly is that it is avoided with relative ease, but for a limited group of people. So if you can afford to make gifts of cash or gifts of financial assets, you will be um, much more able to avoid inheritance tax than someone whose wealth is tied up in their house. I'm not, I'm not saying that's an exa a reason for giving an exemption to the house, but unless we can understand why people resent it so much, I don't think we can really reform it. Um, but as I say, many countries, Austria, Norway, Sweden, not necessarily countries we think of as low tax, um, have abolished inheritance tax. So um, what do we, we, I've said already we have a, a narrow base and a high rate. What do other countries do like the USA? Well, they have a broad base. Interestingly, they have far fewer exemptions, so business assets aren't exempt, but they have a high threshold. So they limit, so the, the threshold is over $11 million per individual. So they limit the, um, uh, the, the scope of the tax. Most people will never pay a state duty in the USA. And they also, by the way, have a much more vigorous lifetime uh, policy, tax, a policy of taxing lifetime gifts. 
We generally don't tax lifetime gifts unless we're giving to trusts in this country. In the USA, they have a certainly very complex but also very um, quite forceful uh, lifetime giving. And that also evens things out a bit for the very wealthy. So sort of slightly surprising results, but it's, uh, estate duty is perhaps less um, unpopular in the US than uh, inheritance taxes in the UK. Um, I've said this, a high, we have a high rate and we have a narrow base. We've talked, I, I heard about talks about reforms to business assets. I think you have to work out what you want to achieve. I mean, if we have a cap, we're going to basically exempt family businesses, but not the, the, the very large private businesses. And maybe that's right. Maybe we should encourage family business, um, even if they're not very successful. But we do need to think what we're trying to achieve. Do we want to incentivize investments on the AIM market? That's one of the reasons why we give business property relief for those investments. The idea is you give some form of tax relief to riskier investments. Um, I heard the CGT uplift mentioned, and I'm afraid even that isn't totally straightforward. We did actually have capital gains tax on death from 1965 to 1972 before it was abolished. And you essentially have three options on capital gains tax. You can either rebase all your assets to market value, which is what most countries with an inheritance tax, Germany, the US, UK, et cetera, do. Or you can have a tax charge on the death itself and then deduct the capital <coughs> gains tax from the inheritance tax, which I think is what the IFS are proposing. That has two problems. It's a very, you can end up with very high, slightly arbitrary rates of, in, of tax. I mean, if you looked at it in the current regime, 20% CGT, 40% um, IHT, roughly, um, you could end up with rates of about 52%. So I'm not sure that would be desperately popular. And you'd need to think what you do with the home, which, of course, would be an exempt asset. And the third option um, is what Australia and, to some extent, Canada do, which is a sort of deferral. So you don't rebase the asset, but it's a no-gain, no-loss situation. Um, and that has less liquidity problems because you only have to pay the capital gains tax when you sell. Um, but on the other hand, it can result in further unfairnesses if you have to sell an asset to pay IHT and then you end up paying CGT and can't deduct it. And so none of these are totally straightforward options. And one of the, th the missing factors in all this is that you have to talk about lifetime gifts. Because if you're going to have CGT on death, you'll definitely need it on lifetime gifts. And at the moment, we don't have that. We, ha we have a sort of series of reliefs for, for certain lifetime gifts. Um, we've heard about the main home. You get this residential nil rate band of 175,000, but that's tapered on the larger estates. Otherwise, it's very difficult to do planning with the, with the home, except that you could downsize, move to a smaller house, and give away the cash. Survive seven years, no inheritance tax. So do we really want to incentivize people to keep their homes? I suggest not. Um, we want them, in a way, to downsize and release some capital. One of the pet areas I have is why don't we actually measure what lifetime giving um, is going on? Lifetime gifts generally don't have to be reported. And if you don't report them, you can't really work out what your policy is. And there is a lot of wealth being transferred through lifetime giving that never gets reported, because if you survive seven years, you don't have to report it. And I, I don't think it would be a massive problem to just say to people, any lifetime gift over a certain amount, whether it's 3,000 or 10,000 or whatever you suggest, should be um, reported on an online form. And at least then we get an idea of what is going on. Spouse exemption has been talked about. I mean, that was an introduction. In, until capital transfer tax, we didn't have an unlimited spouse exemption. Almost every country that has inheritance tax does have spouse exemption. Um, should it be extended to cohabitees, given that so many people don't marry um, or are, and are not in a civil partnership? But if you do that, you will lose even more money um, from the system. It was the biggest cause of the fall in take when um, estate duty changed to capital transfer tax was the introduction of the spouse exemption. Personally, I'd probably say cap the spouse exemption, so only exemptions over two million, say, sorry, under two million got, it, got exempt. After that, you, you, you tax them. But that is another complication in the system. I, no one's talked about trusts. Trusts for UK people are usually pretty penal. Trusts for foreign dons are extremely generous, so any, any system on IHT would have to deal with that. Um, and, and for my money, if you're going to keep the current system and just reform it, 
I think you would have to reduce the rates and broaden the base. I think the only way you're going to get the base broadened is to, to reduce the rates quite radically and introduce a lifetime tax. And if you did that so it was 10 or 20%, I think people then start thinking quite carefully whether they really want to pay someone like me not to pay inheritance tax. Um, so I, I, I think that for me the key in reform is to reduce the rates. Just to end really, um, someone mentioned a sessions tax, the idea that you tax the recipient. And it's very popular, um, you know, because it's seen as promoting equality. And actually, interestingly, Margaret Thatcher was very keen on this and even commissioned a green paper. Um, but um, it, was dis it, was, it was not approved of by civil servants. Um, most uh, European countries which operate a sort of system of forced airship that you have to leave your assets to your family do have that sort of system. So the, the donee is taxed, and if you leave your property away from your children, the, there's a higher rate of tax imposed. Ireland is one of the few common law systems that does have this capital acquisitions tax. It's seen as spreading wealth, so over the lifetime of the donee, they get, uh, is, as they inherit more wealth, they pay higher rates of tax. And the idea is that it encourages division of estates and reduces concentration of wealth. There's no real evidence that I've seen that suggests that it does encourage division of estates. Um, and it's quite complicated. Uh, I, and by the way, no country that does this system raises any more money than we do. Um, the only countries that raise materially more money from estate duty and inheritance tax and wealth transfer taxes, I think, are France, Korea, Japan, and Belgium. And they raise significantly more money. Um, but if you are going to go for a recipient's tax, you are still going to have to think about a number of design problems. Ireland, um, it's an interesting system. I think it's probably overcomplicated, and they still haven't quite worked out how to deal with trusts. But it, you know, that, that would be a major reform. Whatever you do, I think um, what we've seen is you have to have political consensus. Because one of the problems of capital transfer tax, which was a lifetime to the grave tax, every lifetime transfer was taxed progressively, was that people just waited until a Tory government got in, knowing that they would change the rules, which indeed they did. Because you're on inheritance tax, you're looking at a long period of time. It's not like income tax. And I think that is one of the problems about reforming inheritance tax. Without some form of political consensus or at least some sort of popular support for the system, it is very difficult to get <coughs> reform. So I'll end on that sort of optimistic note. Lots and lots of food for thought there. And um, Holly, um, we you. will add to that. So hand on to you. Does that work? Yes. Yes. Well, we've heard a lot of really good reforms. <coughs> I think we've heard a lot of really good ideas. Um, sound quite practical and quite doable. But we've also heard a lot about the problems. I had just recount a story. Um, I made a mistake of accepting to be a lecturer on a cruise ship. Uh, that was the first mistake. The second mistake was to talk to them about generational inequality. This was a serious mistake. Uh, I thought it was quite likely they were going to throw me overboard. Um, it was very interesting because it was full of all of your um, aspirational individualists, retired, <laughs> people like sort of senior policemen, middle managers, um, with a ferocious sense of entitlement to pass on everything they'd got and not to be taxed on it. They felt very fiercely about it. You know, I worked all my life to buy my home. My parents never ho had a home. I did. Um, I started with almost nothing. And now I've got this, and I want to hand it to my children. And you're, you can't tell me I can't. And it's passionately felt. And any amount of I mean, some of these figures and statistics I could give them and tell them that it's mainly the rich that pay it, and only 4% of estates, and so on. The feelings about tax are often much stronger than the reality. People feel it strongly and um, don't give up facts, don't deter them. I mean, I think that um, we in this room are very different people. We are not normal. One thing, you're spending all day here talking about inequality. 
and I bet there's nobody here who voted for Brexit, I would think. Um, and the difference in approach to fact and feeling is very important on these matters. And, you know, it's the sort of thing the Daily Mail does have its finger on the button, a headline about, about um, abolishing uh, income tax or only up to uh, a, a, a million was what frightened Gordon Brown off calling an election that he probably would have won uh, back, back in 2009, 2010. Um, so he understood the emotional pull of it, and it is very strong. Um, the response to, to that, the political response to that, is always stealth, um, fiscal drag, things people can't see. They may feel but not quite know why they feel it. Um, you know, Colbert was the one who started that when he talked about the whole art of taxation was to pluck the feathers from the golden goose with as little hissing as possible. So find secretive ways, uh, more acceptable, politically acceptable ways to tax people. It only really, only really, I think, goes so far. And I really do think it's time to talk to people about quite basic principles on fairness. I mean, as we've seen in a lot of your quotes, people are aware of unfairnesses in the tax system. They're not quite sure why or how, but that some people get away with it. There are always stories about the Duke of Westminster not paying any inheritance tax that cut deep and people remember for all their lives and stand as symbols for how the tax system does or doesn't work. So it seems to me quite a good idea that politicians who try and talk about going back to basic principles of taxing uh, all income from all sources at the same rate, which after all Nigel, Nigel Lawson did, and to say that you know whether you're a rentier, whether you're a landlord, whether you're a, uh, uh, you know you've got large numbers of shares, or whether you earn it with the sweat of your brow, there sh it certainly shouldn't be advantaged the amount of tax that you pay on things you haven't earned, and I think we could go back to talking about those principles, and we don't seem very close to it at the moment. I mean, it's interesting that this only raises 7 billion and 15 billion in a, in a decade. That's not all that much, really. Margaret Hodge made a wonderful speech in the, um, it was a short speech, not reported except by me, um, in the autumn statement debate. And she, being the great expert on fraud, cheating, tax havens, corruption, from her time as head of the uh, PAC, and has always and has continued on this, and has a, has an APPG on on, on tax avoidance, um, evasion, and uh, corruption. And she, in her speech, came up with pretty much you know billions and billions that could be collected, perhaps more easily than through inheritance tax, which causes all of us all this fascination and all of us this passion, because we passionately feel, I think a lot of us here probably, that inheritance tax is right in principle. But when you look at the sort of figures she was presenting, and she has very good, she has great files this high to back up what she says. She's not just tossing out figures. She can talk about a tax gap of 36 billion. She can talk about how there were only 11 prosecutions of the wealthy for cheating last year, 420,000 uh, of people who were filing their taxes late. Google, Apple, Facebook um, made about 9.6 billion, but only paid 297 uh, million in tax, not been chased, or not effectively, or not yet. 500, 350 billion, she said, lost in fraud and money laundering. Prosecutions have fallen by 75%, a much diminished HMRC's capacity. To say nothing of all the things she's been chasing in the PACC of wasted procurements, whether it's you know a mere 2.2 billion lost in the HS2 phase two wasted, but she has lists and lists of those. Tax reliefs. She says 1,180 tax reliefs, and we have no idea what they cost. The Treasury doesn't know what they cost, but there is an estimate that they cost 195 billion. Uh, very little scrutiny of, of that. So Labour has tiptoed into this, talking about 
dealing with carried interest for private equity and dealing with non-DOMs. Um, you could do worse than read Paul Johnson's wonderful book, Follow the Money, which is full of good ideas for chasing up disgraceful tax relief, some of which you've talked about, such as the agriculture and business IHT relief and um, certainly allowing capital gains to die with your, with it when you die, not having to pay it. Um, I was very glad to see that Rachel Reeves at the Labour Party conference was spotted walking about with a copy of his book under her arm. I felt this was a good sign. And indeed, although she rules out many things, she does not, does not rule out all of these tax reliefs. I mean, this is a magic money tree potential for her that she recognises, and I, I think we'll be um, following through on some of that. Um, I think that, so I think when we look at IHT and all the passionate feelings we have it, on it, of it ourselves on you know, the equality side of the equation versus the cruise ship people, we should perhaps ourselves keep some sense of proportion about what's a relatively small amount of money and how strongly we feel about it. I do think that it is time for politicians to be much bolder in talking about tax in general in explaining inheritance tax and why it's there, explaining a lot of the things that we've heard today about social mobility. Um, I think there are an awful lot of forces working against that. I go along from time to time when I'm invited to wealth managers, because I live in quite a posh place and because I'm old, I get sent invitations to things like St. James's Place wealth managers, and you go there, and they do these horror videos with pictures of trucks coming at you. This is the tax man who is coming at you when you die. And unless you, and unless you sign up with us, pay a lot of money, incidentally, for signing up with outrageous charges, and we can hide your money in secretive trusts. Often they can't, really, and they lie about it. Um, that's, the, uh, that's the culture that the cruise ship people, that the Daily Mail people are imbibing all the time. The tax man is coming after you and is very unjust. I think we need a lot more education about tax. I know you spend your time educating people. That you say it's even hard with students. I would like to see maths GCSE full of tax, much more tax than some of the more abstruse things they have, as if they were going to be junior mathematicians. I think people should really be taught about it. Um, be, you know, they should also learn about pensions and mortgages too. Um, I think it's puzzling that the youth don't, youth don't rebel more. They should be much more rebellious about what's happened to them, what my generation has done to them. We've taken the houses, we've got the pensions, we've had everything, and free education, free university, uh, and taken everything from then. And I don't know why they're so passive. Pretty pathetic, really. Um, we were more rebellious in the 60s when we had far less to rebel about. Um, I think it's also a question of looking at how little Labour changed the political psyche about tax and these things. After 97, they were afraid. They were always afraid. And let's hope that the next lot will try harder to talk about tax, not as a burden. Never use the word burden. Why not talk? And I often do and find audiences, even ones that are not naturally responsive, nodding their heads if you say, Mrs. Thatcher used to say, uh, you will spend the pound in your pocket much better than the state will. To which Labour should reply, the opposite is the case. Think of what you most value in life. What do you care about most? It's your family's health and security and education and safety and living in beautiful surroundings and looking after heritage and sport, leisure, entertainment. All of these things are things that pound buys. The state buys for you things you can never buy in a shop. Uh, and I think it's high time that Labour people started talking up the great benefits of taxation. I wait to see it. <laughs> I'll stop there. <laughs> so all the young people have to be more rebellious. Um, I have um, just a couple of questions, sort of technical questions. Um, Emma, you said France, Japan, Belgium are collecting more tax than we are, and Korea. So um, they're the countries to look at, aren't they? What, how are they doing it? 
Well, they're very, it, France is a very, um, is another s system which where the wealth, wealthy, the really wealthy don't pay it. It's full of reliefs and exemptions. And those who are um, more middle income are, or middle wealth, I suppose, are paying it. So it's not a, it, it, it's not a very coherent system. Korea, I know le less about. Japan is actually an interesting country because I think there's much more acceptance there that you pay high rates of inheritance tax. I think the rates are 55%, but you're doing that in return for a very good care system because it's a very elderly population. So there's a sort of quid pro quo there. And um, Belgium, I'm still looking at. It's, it, it looks more complicated, but it, it, there's, there's a, there are options there. But it's not a donee based system in its purest form. Yeah. Just yeah, to, add, to add a couple of things on that is that, I mean, I, th I think I'm right in saying that, at least with regards to France and Korea, they also just have quite low thresholds and some yes. pretty high top marginal rates. Um, so France, I think, is 100,000. Is the is the uh, tax free threshold for receiving inheritances? Korea has a top marginal rate of sixty percent. I found out the other day um, from some Korean visitors, uh, and you won't be surprised that there's a big discussion about reducing that rate or abolishing the tax going on in Korea at the moment. So uh, a lot of similar trends, but I think to get a lot more revenue at the end of the day, um, you know, having higher rates and lower thresholds does does do something. There is actually a trade off. Then there's an acceptance point, Joey. I don't know if you want to come back on that. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, interestingly, uh, a lot of the people we spoke to really, I mean, people don't really know about either the rates or the thresholds, right? There isn't, there's just not really any knowledge of that. Maybe of the 100 people we spoke to, every now and then someone would come and know the threshold. But I think basically it seems that people were much more concerned about the threshold than the rates, really. Um, primarily, basically, I mean, the politics of inheritance tax is driven by people who aren't going to pay it, really, because it's such a small percentage of people paying it. And basically, people's concern is that they just never think that they should be the one paying it. And while that is obviously most of the population currently, I think raising the threshold is just that signal that you will not be the one paying this tax, because you can see it's this huge amount that is more than you expect to have. Um, the rates, I, I basically, I think every time the rates are mentioned, people think 40% is really high and definitely would want that reduced, but it's, there's just not as much knowledge about that. And I think, I mean, funnily enough, I think cutting the rates might have the reverse effect, potentially, of signalling how high the rates currently are. And if you don't cut it substantially enough, people would just sort of respond that the, these rates are still increasingly high. I do think there is potentially an interesting benefit of looking at uh, the progressive, a progressive rate could be an interesting solution. I, 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 some people did see that as a reason to, well, I, basically there's a sense that um, inheritance tax is this very unusual tax in that having, uh, most taxes have to some extent a progressive rate and people felt that putting an, a progressive rate on inheritance tax might just like make it feel a bit more normal. Um, that there is this sort of weird jump where it's, if we can just like put a progressive rate on a bit more of a normal tax that people are, don't see as such a um, stain on the system, which is what it currently is. It, it used to be progressive. I mean, it was progressive to 85% in 1969. Um, it just, it was Lawson who had the Norton zero and 40% rates in 86. It wasn't any more popular then. <laughs> but I mean, I disagree on rates, actually. I actually, I think if you put rates down, you can broaden the base. I promise you, you will not be able to broaden the base if you have high rates, and that is exactly what, f for all the stuff about France, it, it's it, how it raises the money. It's not a fair way of raising the money. They have all sorts of valuation issues on businesses, which are not, which are very distorting. Um, it, it's, it is a deeply unpopular tax there in its current form. So, and, and the problem is, if you have a high rate, you will have lots of vested interests asking for a relief because the business will say, "Well, I can't pay 40% tax." When, um, when I die, because the business will, the only way you can get the money is to pay a dividend, and then I'm going to have to pay income tax. And you have to take those things into account. If it, it, I mean, remember, we had 50% relief for business property, effectively 20% tax, until 1992. And no one really moaned about businesses too much then, or farms. Then it got abolished to 100%, which was never really intended to be permanent. And we've all got used to businesses and farms having 100% relief. 
if you only gave them 50% relief, it would be a 20% rate. And I don't think you'd have a huge amount of kickback on that. Whether you want it administratively is another problem, because of course you're then going to have to value the businesses, so that's more work for revenue. Yeah, I mean, I, I would suggest that there is definitely a much stronger case for reducing the rate um, for some of these exemptions. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the vested interests are, are, are clearly very strong, particularly in the case of businesses. I, I, I would support, yeah, the, the cap, I think, basically deals with some of the most emotive stories that would come out, um, like ca capping the relief so that only £500,000, for example, of business um, relief is available, deals with some of the most emotive, emotive stories that might come out of businesses having to split up due to inheritance tax, and then, yeah, potentially a reduction um, in the rate for um, more valuable businesses, I think, would help. Um, but, but you need a lifetime gift if you're going to have a cap on business, because yep. all that will happen is people make a lifetime gift of their business, mm -hmm. and then, and then you, you still haven't got the tax. I mean, I wonder if um, IFS is going to do any more work on unpacking their business relief, because there are bits of business relief that we might think have a rationale, and parts that don't have such a good rationale. And it's always just lumped together. Hmm. But there are people who are using both agricultural reliefs and business reliefs in a way that you might be able to justify. And then there are people who are using it in other ways, which you really can't justify. Yeah, I mean, I think kind of instinct uh, amongst economists is always to think, well, you know, once we start to treat certain types of things differently, even with maybe an idea that that sort of activity is... Um, kind of better, then people will start to take advantage of it and kind of move their wealth into these particular forms. Um, so I suppose that maybe the, the rationale which is put forward for these sorts of business reliefs is, well, we want to protect the succession of family... Farms and businesses. Yeah, farms yeah. and family businesses. Um, now, there's, I think, a few different issues with that. Um, and, and, and some practical ones, I mean, you don't even have to continue the business once you've inherited it to get the uh, exemption from tax, so that it's not really directed at that. Um, secondly, there's not really very good evidence, I would say, that businesses retained within families are uh, more successful, perhaps the opposite, if anything. Um, there's maybe an argument made that if someone's faced with a big tax bill, they have to sell this, the, the family farm, the family business, and, and that they don't want to do that and that we don't want to be forcing people to do that. I think there would be provisions you could put in place um, whereby people could you know, pay over a period of time that would alleviate that sort of concern. So, um, But I, I think if you're yeah. going to convince politicians yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, that they should remove these reliefs and they are going to be beset with the people with doing the special pleasing, you're mm. going to have to put these... You can't just put the figures to them. You have to have these debates. And there are also some bits of business relief yeah. which you can easily pick off, like yeah. the AIM yeah, market, yeah. which is completely different. Yeah, so that's a good point. So yeah, I should, I should explain <coughs> so, a, a little yeah. more that um, there is this uh, a AIM shares, which are originally stood for Alternative Investments Market, which is kind of like a stock market, but not the main London Stock Exchange idea is that there's kind of more risky early stage businesses that get investment through that. And that uh, is inheritance tax exempt. Um, there, you know, this is clearly not a family business. Um, it seems to be much less of a case. There's a, there's a lot of companies that have basically set up, and their business model is uh, to design products to allow people to exploit that and move their wealth into that when they get to older age. Um, yeah, I would agree that that seems so I the most egregious I'm saying example. You maybe need to go for low yeah. hanging fruit first rather than the whole thing, even though as an economist yeah. you might yes. think, well, it, that we shouldn't draw these distinctions, but given the points that Dan and Polly have made, mm -hmm. you know, there, are, there are arguments for splitting it up. Yeah, and, and, and potentially <coughs> doing some, you know, some of these things will be better than, than doing nothing at all. Yeah. Uh, well, I remember, do private businesses do quote on AIM, and if, if you're going to say you're, you're suddenly going to have a, a tax on death, which you wouldn't have had, if you don't quote on AIM, that, that's, I mean, all of this is just, yes. there's so it choices. Has to be a discussion, yeah, choices, yeah. I'm saying is that you can't just talk about the figures, you have to have those yeah. discussions, I think. I mean, Germany has a system which is, and, and Ireland actually, which have business property relief. Um, Germany raises less than us actually on, on, on death, but there's, they also have a lifetime tax, so it's slightly misleading. But um, they have more restrictions so that you have to have a minimum number of employees. 
and it has to continue. So there are more restrictions around the sort of business that does qualify um, compared with, with the UK, where obviously it is, it is more liberal and they have longer holding periods as well. We can get business property relief after two years holding. So, so. I feel, you know, there is a, lawyers do descend into the detail and that is a problem, but unless you're prepared to do that, you have to go for such big sweeping changes that it's going to be hard to get these through. Unless you lower the rate and then you and say, then I don't need these re reliefs, yeah, you know, maybe, because yes. people will get 10 years to pay it at the moment, 20%. It's not such a big, big burden. So that's a, an argument for lowering the rate. Um, should I? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, yeah, basically, I think the success of doing that and resisting some of those pressures from the business community is about the extent to which a party can frame removing some of these exemptions around we're making the tax system simpler and fairer. And the problem is, is that often changes to the tax system are just seen in very cynical terms that they're just trying to increase the tax rate through sneaky ways that are too confusing for the public to understand and that removing these exemptions would just be interpreted as whichever party trying to increase the inheritance tax take, and that would definitely be a risk. Um, the problem is, is that neither party have branded themselves specifically as a party delivering to fairer and simpler taxes, and so there is just that cynicism there. There's not, there's not any association between the parties and this approach that would justify these changes to the tax system. Um, I think I should open up for questions from the floor. Um, the lady in the second row with the tartan scarf. Yeah. Um, I have a question around uh, how inheritance tax can be reformed to address generational inequalities that Polly was talking about. Um, so even if we do all the reforms that David mentioned, uh, we still have a situation where the majority of people uh, leave their inheritances to their children. So we've got, given that the average life expectancy in the UK is around 80, we've got people in their 80s leaving everything uh, to their children in middle age. And generally, when you're middle age, you've already got your home, etc. And you're probably earning the most that you will be in your career. Um, and sort of one of the ways to do this, I've always looked at Ireland, because it obviously incentivizes people to share out the wealth and maybe um, leave inheritances to their grandchildren or great-grandchildren. Um, what are ways that we can sort of do that, a similar thing in the UK, um, that also don't exacerbate the inequalities that we've already got between people who <laughs> can get a leg up from their parents um, within sort of my generation? Um, shall we take another question and then I'll come back? Yeah, the gentleman behind that lady. Thank you. Uh, I think what's missing in this debate is how we need to create that incentive for the super rich to happily pay for this tax. Uh, so for instance, convince them it might not be a good idea to give all of your wealth to your children. It might be, uh, you know, de incentivize them uh, to actually work hard, right? And also, maybe it is good to invest this in productivity growth in, in those less fortunate individuals who are nevertheless very motivated. So that will benefit your children indirectly as well. So, yeah, so that's just fine. Okay, so shall we take those two and then I'll come back to the next question. Um, would you so like to start, David? In. Yeah, so I mean, the, the million dollar questions or the um, billions of dollar questions in a way, um, so I think it's a very good point, and we should bear in mind some of the context here about inheritances and inheritance tax. So generally received on average in your late 50s, early 60s, maybe not going to do much, as you're saying, for these sort of getting on the housing ladder issues that we saw earlier on in the day. I think the other thing I think to bear in mind is just um, inheritances are large, but inheritance tax is not, as I said. So what inheritance tax is doing in terms of uh, equalizing at all some of the disparities between those of richer poor parents and those of poorer parents are really pretty small. So we estimate that those with the wealthiest of the parents will inherit on average 380,000, I think it is, next year, but only about 10% on that, of that on average is kind of taken by the tax. Um, so maybe I don't have uh, any very good solutions to what you're saying. I, I suppose you're right that if there's a system in which you have kind of lifetime receipts 
taxation, and you have kind of annual uh, gift exemptions to that. Some countries, um, uh, I know the Netherlands setting, they uh, put in some special tax exemptions for gifts made earlier in life for specific purposes. Um, I'm not sure if I would say that that's a good way to go, potentially because of the, your kind of follow-up, which is that you might expect that those are then able to take use of, to, to make use of that are those uh, with wealthy parents. And I speculate that it might even exacerbate um, it, the intergenerational wealth persistence that we saw earlier in the day. Um, so I'm afraid that's not a very uh, positive, helpful um, answer. Maybe others have, have some better ideas. Do you want to come back then? Well, I mean, I think what you're talking about is a sort of donee-based tax. So the more you give, you spread your wealth, the lower the rate of tax. And, and that does break up concentrations of wealth. I don't, I'm not sure that it does, in the end, people do do that. But um, it's partly because the data on capital, on, on this donee based tax, doesn't really demonstrate that. Because in a lot of countries like France, Switzerland, etc., the, the, the further away you go from the children, the higher the rate of tax. So it's sort of doing the opposite of what you say. I certainly think a donee based tax is quite an interesting way forward. It's quite a big change. Um, and it, you know, that, that isn't just a sort of minor reform. That is a completely different but system. That's what Callaghan originally intended. Well, it was what Thatcher was quite yeah, keen on. Her, Calla her, originally, it was going, capital transfer was, tax was going to be donee based, but it was too complicated. I think it's quite, it was quite, it, part of the reason the revenue probably don't like it is it's harder to collect, because obviously you're looking at the donee and the build up over lifetime. I think, in a way, that may have gone out of the window, that objection, because obviously you've got much better technology to record all these lifetime gifts. And over time, I, 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 you wouldn't need something as complicated as Ireland because Ireland does it by who you inherit from, and, and, that, uh, and then the rates of tax go up depending on how much you've inherited from them. Or you could just say, the more I inherit, it doesn't matter who I've inherited it from, the higher my rate of tax. So there are different ways of doing it. Um, I mean, there, it, it's sort of quite an easy tax to avoid in some ways through trust, so you'd have to think that through that quite carefully. So, I, I mean, wonder I if it would be an easy, easy way to it, avoid if you simply said that every form of income that comes in, whether it's money from your parents during your lifetime or whatever, is always taxed at the same rate so that it's just part of your income. Maybe you don't even necessarily have to accumulate it over the, over the years. You just keep paying it and you always pay it. It seems to me that it's alarming that the state doesn't actually know how much money is given in gift because if people survive for seven years, it's never added up. So we don't know what happens in terms of large shifts of wealth from parents to children, which are likely to rise considerably. Lots more people are going into things like equity release in order to give their children more. And it seems to me that those who receive it, the children who receive it, should be made to acknowledge that they have to pay tax on it it's a huge advantage that they've got. And the idea that it should be taxed, not only have they got this money that other people don't get because they haven't got rich parents, but also they don't even pay any tax on it. So it seems to me as a principle of fair taxation that taxing the receiver is a good way to go. Um, sorry, I'll just quickly come in on that. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting actually how people, um, how members of the public frame the inheritance tax debate. So some really, first and foremost, see inheritance as something given by someone, and others completely see it as something received by someone. And that clearly affects how people view inheritance tax. Is it punishing aspiration, or is it just adjusting for the privilege of receiving inheritance? Um, just to your point, quickly, just um, it's interesting. Spain have a system where they vary the rates according to the net wealth of the receiver which incentivizes um, giving to people with lower amounts of wealth, essentially, to pay a lower rate, which helps do that. Um, and yeah, I, I guess the other problem is, is sort of in terms of like diverting to the next generation, um, a lot of people really just sort of are concerned about the idea of like handouts to um, the less wealthy. Um, that was, there was quite a lot of opposition to that among the focus groups that we held. Um, 
really the key for a lot of people is just funding the NHS and schools, and that is really what drives support for inheritance taxation. Um, in and of itself is supporting the next generation. And I think you can maybe be framing around a future generations fund to support education, creating that um, skip to the next generation. Obviously, inheritance tax is small and it's not gonna have a huge impact, but maybe that could try and increase it a little bit. I'll take two questions here. Thanks. Thank you. Um, firstly, an observation that um, Polly referred to the Duke of Westminster. Of course, I think it's true that the top biggest landowners in Britain are all still dukes, so we haven't. It's not just the Duke of Westminster who's there. I suspect James Dyson is trying to join that group, but that does show that um, inheritance tax, capital transfer tax, estate duty hasn't been very effective in that way. Second, as I once heard Geoffrey Howe say, every relief he said it after he retired as Chancellor and allowance he gave was a waste of time and money. People were going to behave that way anyway, and it was, um, then people just try to do the same thing. But I'd like to pick up on Evan's point about stability. And I think if we are going to change the system, and I'm very much for a, for a recipient tax, is perhaps we need to look at the political system and move on to proportional representation, which will give us the chance of a stable government. I think that's coming a <laughs> bit beyond our remit. So, so yes, yeah, thank this, you. This type, of, this type yeah. of taxation change will be okay. required. The great thing about proportional representation, it is the answer to everything. <laughs> <laughs> Mohammed Amin, I'm a retired tax advisor. My question is for David Sturrock. I assume that the numbers you gave us earlier for the impact of the tax changes you were talking about were all static in the sense that they don't assume any change in behavior. And my question related to that is at how much money in terms of wealth, whether it's five, 10 or 20 million, you think is enough to make people simply walk away from the UK and take their money with them as certain continental countries found when they tried wealth taxes. Thank you, sir. David, that was directly for yeah, you. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go. So, to be honest, in terms of sort of international migration effects of inheritance tax, I don't, I don't really know. I would speculate that people, particularly their older ages, are not going to be that, that, that mobile responsive to tax. Um, but on the, on the sort of broader issue of um, we were giving these... Uh, costings that are based on no behavioral response and so you know what do we think would actually happen or how do people respond to these sorts of changes in tax and avoidance channels I would say that um, you know it looks like people were pretty responsive uh, to uh, the availability of certain channels so you would think that a kind of comprehensive approach to tackling these different avoidance uh, pos the, the channels that make avoidance possible would be much more effective than, than kind of closing anyone alone. So, you know, I might think that if you just abolished business relief, you would get much less than if you kind of more comprehensively addressed the issues that we were discussing. In terms of how people respond in terms of, you know, building up wealth in the first place, and do they, will they just save less and spend more on themselves? On that, we do have a bit more evidence from a few different countries, and it seems that people are not really that responsive to inheritance taxation. It's not. Uh, it doesn't really factor that much into their decisions throughout their life over how much to, to save. Emma? Um, yeah, I mean, you, you, if you wanted to avoid inheritance tax, moving abroad wouldn't do it for you. I mean, if you and I moved abroad and sat there and had a house in the UK and came back but were non-resident, we'd still pay inheritance tax because we would be domiciled here. Um, it's foreign dom it, it, residence isn't that relevant to inheritance tax. It's domicile status, which is quite sticky and quite hard for people who have lived here most of their lives to lose. Um, so it, 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 moving abroad in itself wouldn't necessarily save you, in, well, it wouldn't save you inheritance tax. Some countries like Germany have a tail, so it's a long tail. So if you've been there, you, if, you, if you leave, you've got, if you, you, there's an exit tax and you can still be within the scope of IHT for a period of time. And you could do something like that even if you abolish foreign dom status. I'm not sure I agree that there's no behavioral change. I mean, it's, it's very noticeable that when Canada and Australia, which were federal states, and they abolished inheritance tax in some states but not others, people really did move across the border. Um, so, it, and, and that, of course, in the end, led to the abolition of inheritance tax in Australia and Canada altogether. And it was this competition, because it was a state-run tax, it was a competition between states that led it. So 
where it's not that much effort, I think people, they can just hop across the border. They really try and avoid it. Um, and Switzerland has a similar issue with wealth tax, actually, because it's cantonally based. So I, I think there is behavioral response. Ours, funnily enough, is one of the sticky bits of our inheritance tax. Moving abroad isn't that, it, it, it's not that easy to avoid it. You've really got to sever your links. Are there any more questions? Yeah, Francis. I wanted to bring the discussion back to what this conference is about, which is social mobility and wealth. And at the moment, I'm finding the discussion of some of the technical aspects of how inheritance tax works or might work or whatever a little bit disconnected from that. Because as Judith reminded me at the break, um, when you're looking at taxes, you have to consider how they're going to be used. How are you going to use inheritance tax to break the difficulty that I think came across to me from the rest of the day, which the young lady over here mentioned, which is actually the enormous difficulty that young people have in accumulating wealth, even if they have the prospect of inheritance when they get older, because they're not going to inherit until they're in their 50s. Could we consider something like a universal basic dividend? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I can try and speak to the public perception of that. I do, I, again, I, I, I think it is vulnerable to the sense of seeming like a handout. Um, and just, there is really not much understanding among the public of the impact of inheritances on the inequalities. And there is generally a sense, if, if you try and propose fixing, using inheritance tax to address social mobility concerns, people immediately say, fix the housing market, fix the jobs market, level up the UK. Um, and so I think there is a sort of scepticism about the role of inheritance in that and using a uh, like generational dividend. Um, I think would, people wouldn't really relate to that that closely. I, I, again, I would suggest that probably I mean, you can, uh, what we suggest is maybe doing something like a future generations fund where you channel it into something like education. And in doing so, you give an intuitive link around inheritances, right? It's sort of as, you're passing um, wealth from one generation to the next, you're using a bit to contribute to education. It's small amounts of money, it's not gonna have a huge impact, but it's, it's something and it allows inheritance tax to remain and hopefully pushes a few more people into that camp of seeing inheritance as a driver of inequalities and something that we should be using and diverting to support some of the next generation um, and address some of those inequalities. Um, yeah, thanks for bringing us back to the, uh, you know, the topic of the, the day. I think that's really, really important and I think that I would say that perhaps um, you know, addressing social mobility uh, through policy and thinking about this impact of these wealth transfers, I think that maybe uh, our, our sort of best hope is doing some of these things that might um, make parental wealth assistance less important in determining your uh, life chances through your early adulthood rather than trying to sort of clamp down on the amount of, of help being given. So, some of the things that we were discussing in the last session really around um, alleviating some of the, the, the constraints to getting on the housing ladder, the uh, constraints for those who are living in less productive parts of the country to move to where good jobs are and to promote, if possible, good jobs in other parts of the country. Um, not easy things as well. I mean, there are parts of the tax system that can play a role there. We always talk about uh, abolishing stamp duty to try and get housing more efficiently used, uh, same in terms of reform of, of council tax. Um, so I think that some of these things together as a package are maybe sort of more hopeful um, rather than sort of trying to do it all through the inheritance tax system, I think I, think I would agree. Yeah. I mean, the w one thing is that, again, this connects with other things, so it connects a lot with social care. So one reason people don't want to give money away is they're worried about their social care, which hasn't been fixed. And there's a wonderful little video with, from Aaron Advani, which I saw on Twitter yesterday, which was saying, uh, who works with the IFS, saying, uh, don't worry too much about having to pay inheritance tax because you'll probably spend it all on social care anyway. So, <laughs> um, but I do think that, you know, you're right, that it, we have to link back to the whole problem, but 
every single tax then every single tax problem links with another social problem and one reason people are wanting to amass money and feel they should be able to is because they're worried about what happens to them in their old age and then they're worried that that money will somehow be taken so um, shall we just um, quickly sum have a summing up from everyone on the panel um, Emma do you want to start going in order uh. Yeah, I think it's interesting, and I, I'd certainly take the point that it's got a bit technical and it's, it, we should remember what we're, we're here to do. Uh, I think what I'm trying to say is that design is important in achieving your objectives, and we need to be very clear what we want to achieve, and whether, uh, and political consensus, I suppose, those are the, the two things. And I worry a little bit, although I like the sessions tax, I worry that the sheer effort of getting that sort of on the statute book with a lot of political capital may just be too much. Maybe that's, maybe I'm, I'm, I should be more enthusiastic. In principle, I think it's a great idea. I could just see a lot of things going wrong in the delivery. And, and maybe we should just try and get the current state of affairs reformed and fairer. Because I, I think we can all agree it's not a very sensible system at the moment. Sure. Yeah. Um, Dan and then Holly. Sure. sure. Um, yeah, well, my call to politicians would be rebrand yourself as trying to, for the next election, make a fairer, simpler tax system to fund and fix Britain. Um, part of that can be removing the exemptions in inheritance tax and also, because of the sort of bizarre nature of inheritance tax, provide a clear reason why we're taxing inheritances, linking to potentially things like education, and that can allow a more sustainable, fairer and a higher revenue inheritance tax, um, if they're bold enough to do so. I'm glad we came to social care, but only just at the end, because in a way, um, the, the scheme that Labour came up with in 2010 was that on retirement you should put a dollop of, of uh, capital, if you've got capital, or a lien on your house, if you've got a house, if you have the state would put it in, each person would put in a certain amount that would pay for social care. That would be very egalitarian because it would release the young from having to pay the old social care of the old, make sure that the old use their own capital, which they should, for their own social care. There was a lot of indignance about it called the death tax. But um, I think that's one way of thinking about inheritance tax. It's a sort of a pre-inheritance pre tax, a pre-death tax. And David, I'll let you have, since you put this all together, <laughs> you should have the last word. OK, well, I'll, I'll just say, uh, first of all, you know, thank you to everyone for coming who's presented today. Um, hopefully, as well as maybe a feeling of doom and gloom, there's been a few glimmers of hope and some potential policy solutions and an idea that progress could be possible on some of these difficult issues. Um, so thank you very much to this panel, to Emma, Judith, Polly, and Dan, um, to all of the other sessions. Uh, I find this really fascinating. Um, please do look out for future IFS events and hope to see you um, at similar um, events in the future. Thanks finally to the IFS events team also for helping to make today possible and enjoy the rest of your evening.